Before we get started, I'd like to share a, uh, a, a personal story with you. Uh, several years ago, my daughter was in third, fourth grade, and anyway, we're sitting at dinner one night, and uh, you know how kids are, they just, there's no preamble, it's just, they come out with it. And she says, uh, Jason says you're not an engineer. Jason? Who is Jason? Now Jason's, this, you know, Jason's in my class at school, and Jason was there today for uh, show and tell, and he bought pic brought pictures of his, uh, the airplanes that his dad makes, builds at, at Boeing. And uh, he says his dad's an engineer at Boeing, right? And so Mrs. Snow, Mrs. Snow's the teacher in her, uh, for her class, she says, Mrs. Snow asks, you know, does anybody else here have uh, a mother or father who's an engineer and she said I, and so I raised my hand and so uh, Mrs. Snow said well uh, um, uh, what kind of things does your dad make and she says well you know m my dad doesn't really make anything my, my dad just sits at the computer all the time right? and so um, this little punk Jason speaks up and he says, you know, if you don't make stuff, you're not an engineer. So that's Jason's dad speaking through Jason, if you ask me, right? So anyway, that night when we, you know, you read a story before you go to bed at night, that night I decided that I was going to tell her a story. And so the story I told her is fundamentally the story I'm going to tell you today. Uh, her story had more elephants and trains and airplanes in it than yours is. You're going to have patience and... Uh, specimens, but fundamentally the core is going to be the same, okay? So let me uh, take a look here at what our, uh, what our agenda is going to be. First, one, what, what I want to do first of all is, is um, talk about what an industrial engineer is, where, where we specialize, how you, how you recognize industrial engineers. Talk about industrial engineering over the last hundred years because that's about what our history is. Uh, and I'm going to break it into three pieces. Early 20th century, uh, 10 years either side of WW2, and from the 1960s to, to where we are today. Then we're going to look at some projects, some ex just a few of the examples of projects that we're working on with um, uh, laboratory uh, people in specimen procurement services. And then we'll, we'll loop all the way back. So we'll start with the fundamentals in industrial engineering 100 years ago, and we'll loop back and we'll see what did the fundamentals in industrial engineering look like today. So if, if you have to um, think about um, or distinguish industrial engineering from the other uh, engineering disciplines, the, the most uh, telling characteristic of industrial, industrial engineering is that we, are, uh, we focus on people and people interface with technology. So how people use systems, how they they work with technologies, whether that's computers, whether that's machines, uh, but th it, that interface is very important, and, and that's one area we focus on. We focus on the integration of systems, how you bring complex components together, complex uh, uh, organizations. So, for instance, you think about a medical facility and all of the different, any, any one of those uh, components in the medical, uh, in a hospital, for instance, is very complex. And how do you bring all of those together to cost effectively, safely, and with high quality move patients through the system. And then the other, uh, the third component is really information. Uh, we, uh, the, the underlying mathematics for uh, industrial and systems engineering is probability and statistics. So when, when students ask me, you know, how do, how do you distinguish as a pre-engineer uh, the different engineering disciplines. That's sort of what I talk to them about. I talk to them about the, uh, the mathematics. And so when we go out into the field and we want to identify the kind of uh, applications that industrial engineers are involved with, here's, here's some examples. So we're talking about transportation systems. We have a lot of capital equipment. We have a lot of people. We have a lot of schedules. And there's a lot of performance characteristics that we're concerned with. There are safety issues. There's ergonomic issues. You think about the uh, Walt Disney World, Walt Disney, uh, Disneyland. Um, they have an enormous number of industrial engineers that are involved with making that organization work 
effectively. Um, you've encountered this middle picture here at the, the uh, right here at the uh, SeaTac, right? This is Homeland Security moving us through the uh, the system to uh, before we can uh, get on the airplanes. A healthcare example. This is one that's most likely pre-scheduled for some kind of scan. We've got another healthcare situation, which is an emergent. So these are. Uh, uh, both of them heavily uh, dependent upon technology, uh, people involved, uh, lots of information, uh, and, and critical decisions being made. Uh, historically, industrial engineering is manufacturing. We're still heavily involved in manufacturing. And you'll see industrial engineering and operations concerned with uh, supply chains, such as the Port of Seattle. And then, of course, the um, retail operations. So if you think about these, I've got a question, right? So we're going to start off with a little quiz here. What would be an indicator to you that a system was not functioning properly? So if you were in, involved in any of these systems, what would make it appear to you that it wasn't functioning properly? Okay. I'll answer it for you. <laughs> All right. So, so basically, you're, you're, you're seeing uh, some problem, some pathology in the system when there's waiting. There, now, there can be cues. So if we look at the picture from SeaTac, and if you've been through that system, it's a very, very long queue, right? So the queue might be an indicator, but in, in SeaTac's in, uh, situation, in the Homeland Security uh, environment, they've got you in that long queue for a, a number of reasons. And the queue moves very quickly, right? Number one, they get you prepared to have your ticket out and your passport and whatever identification, to have your shoes off, but you have an opportunity to learn what you need to do before you get to the head of the line. There's also observation going on. Have you ever looked around when you were in that line at the, the uh, area up above you? So there's, there's a lot of reasons that they're managing you through that, through that system in that way. So, so a long queue might not be the, uh, the uh, example or might not be the, uh, the signal, but uh, excessive waiting would certainly be one. And in any one of these, you would get inv industrial engineers involved either in uh, improving the system or uh, in the design. Hopefully, if they did the design, uh, correctly, we wouldn't have the, uh, the waiting situations. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, how industrial engineering looks at, we're going to say health systems, but really we could just as easily have put in this three-dimensional cube here, we could have put manufacturing on the floor. So we look at, manu we look at uh, health systems and we, we've divided into three categories here. So at the, at the uh, furthest level away from us there, it's discovery. So this is the research in healthcare. This might be the bench scientist in a manufacturing environment. This is someone in, in, in the research in developing new products or new technologies. Uh, you, you move from that into the translation of that uh, new technology or that new discovery into some kind of product or into some kind of way to be tested in a, a, a clinical environment. Uh, you turn that then into uh, practices, best practices for bed, bedside application. And then finally, it becomes part of the operations, part of the daily processes that are going on inside the organization. When we look at the industrial engineering focus, or the areas that industrial engineers specialize in, what they would have on the back of their t-shirt when they came into the room, some of them would say forecasting. This is what I look at, forecasting. And you can look at forecasting, predicting the future in any one of these four areas, right? Um, some of them look at, they, they focus on uh, facilities design, the layout of the organization, the physical arrangement of the organization, where the equipment is, where the people are uh, positioned, where the customers, or in our case, the patients move through the system or the specimens move through the system, decision support. How do we make good economic decisions? How do we make business-driven dri decisions? So this is one of the other areas that industrial engineers are involved in. New product development. Industrial engineers a lot of times get involved in new product development because new product development generally crosses a lot of disciplines, and you want someone that can bring those disciplines together in a team environment. Coordination issues, uh, particularly in project management, 
Uh, this is an area that a lot of industrial engineers will focus on, supply chain networks. So this is getting the materials and the resources that you need into an organization and as well as getting the service or the product to your customer or to your client. Scheduling and planning, we're going to talk quite a bit about that. Resource allocation, you've scheduled a particular quantity of resources into the labs. How do you allocate those resources during that period then? So you have five uh, employees that are working, but you have seven or eight different activities that they have to be responsible for. So how do you allocate the resources? And then obviously there's people that focus uh, on, on the quality issues, identifying the metrics to assure that you're meeting the quality that you want to achieve, and then the standard processes that you would follow to assure that you can achieve those quality uh, performance. So if we look over here on the left-hand side then, what you, what you see basically is a list of some of the academic uh, uh, disciplines that the industrial engineer will go through or some of the methodologies, techniques, uh, concepts that we'll employ. So quality function deployment, QFD, is a way to translate quantitative, qu excuse me, qualitative uh, uh, comments from a customer into quantitative values that an engineer can use to make, uh, uh, to influence the design of a product. Statistical process control, SPC, assures you that you're within the range that you want a process to be in order to provide uh, good results. Um, optimization, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's a mathematical methodology, a uh, set of mathematical techniques actually for uh, uh, determining if you have a very, very large choice of uh, alternatives, which would be the best, which would be the best combination. Simulation helps us understand how systems change as you move through time. I told you probability and statistics is really the uh, fundamental mathematics that we use. And data, computation, and visualization are, are critically important to, uh, uh, to communicating results. So let's, let's look at uh, industrial engineering. And I just want to talk about three people that are, you know, they're, they're, they're really the foundation of industrial engineering. Uh, Frederick Taylor, you've probably heard of Frederick Taylor, um, work simplification, but primarily from the, the principles of scientific management. He published that in 1911. And what Taylor had done was uh, work at taking apart the tasks that people performed, identifying what those micro components were, and then looking at how you could improve the performance of those micro tasks that were, uh, those micro movements that were going on. Um, Taylor made a, a lot of contributions in the whole, in, in the concepts that we just accept as, uh, that we would expect to be available in an organization today, such as capabilities for training, uh, involving using HR to help select the appropriate employees for the type of jobs that they're going to be performing, uh, putting in place uh, incentive systems to motivate the employees to work harder, faster, because that's generally what we were talking about in the late 1890s, early 1900s. Um, worked on laying out the production environment, where would you put the equipment, uh, where would you have the materials stored? How would the materials move through? As well as purchasing and inventory management systems. Now, the two people that came along, and they were sort of colleagues, disciples uh, of um, Taylor, were the uh, husband and wife team of uh, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. And maybe you've heard of these people in Cheaper by the Dozen, the movie, right? It's been made about three times, but... Uh, uh, it's kind of hard to believe that Myrna Loy played uh, uh, Lillian Gilbreth, but nevertheless, the, the original uh, uh, production. And, but but the, the, uh, they were both very heavily involved in uh, this, this scientific management and the development of scientific management and what it meant. And they were uh, leaders in involving and in, in bringing to it the um, social sciences and understanding, trying to understand how the way you structured the job, the constraints that you placed on the employee, how that motivated, demotivated, 
and influence the performance of the, uh, the workers. And they were also quite instrumental in the office furniture, uh, developing office furniture that was comfortable and was uh, ergonomically, we'd call it today, friendly. Uh, they were the source of the uh, time and motion studies. Uh, and they were the first ones, or one of the first ones, to employ uh, movie cameras to actually understand what the, you know, where, whereas Taylor was using observation on his own without any ability to record, they were using movie cameras to re record and look at that, those micro movements that were made. Um, industrial engineering, the first continuing curriculum for industrial engineering started in 1908, and that was at Penn State and Syracuse University. So, you know, relatively a young uh, profession. And until 1949, uh, we were actually part of mechanical engineering. So we would go to the uh, mechanical engineering national meetings, and that's the uh, professional organization that we belong to, and it was only in 1949 that the American Institute of Industrial Engineers was, uh, was formed. So that was, that was um, uh, you know, we, we've got that first phase, right? So that was the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, automotive uh, industry was being developed. Uh, we were building these very large organizations, manufacturing organizations, employing a lot of people. Uh, Pre-World War II, World War II and the 10 years after that were an, a, a great time of development of analytical methodologies. And in fact, a lot of the methodologies that were developed, the, the uh, theories for the methodologies that were developed during World War II were um, uh, uh, classified. And in fact, it wasn't until 1947 that these were declassified. And they were, they were critical, uh, uh, felt to be critical contributors to the success of the uh, uh, Second World War. Uh, but there were some problems that they had or some difficulties, difficulties that they had that limited the size problems that they could undertake. And the difficulties were due to the computational capabilities, and they were extremely limited, you might recall, in the 1940s. And so that's kind of what brings us to this third period, which is post-1960. And this is when we really started uh, to uh, develop uh, computational capabilities and the resources. We also improved the optimization algorithms that we draw on heavily. Statistical methodologies improved. And we began to actually solve some of these larger problems. And the, uh, what we'll come back to is this whole idea of rediscovering the fundamentals. And uh, the Japanese had to do that for us. We've got you know, in the United States, these are 2008. These are the most recent numbers that are available. But we've got about 1.6 million engineers. And industrial engineers, uh, these are employment. This is not how many people we train. But industrial engineers, about, they're, they're number three on the list of the uh, engineering disciplines. OK, so I'm going to go through um, four projects that we have underway. Two of the projects are going to be uh, related to um, uh, human factors. They're going to be related to uh, organization methods, the work methods. And they're not going to be really, even though we've, we've got some mathematical tools we can draw upon, they're not really going to be uh, couched in mathematical modeling. Uh, the last two uh, projects I'm going to talk about are going to be uh, optimization problems. So that, uh, and I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to give you the, uh, two-minute uh, training on what optimization is, because too often I think we talk about it and we don't really try to explain it, and I think it's pretty easy to understand. So if we look at facilities design and workflow, so this is the, this is the situation that we had. So we've got um, uh, a, a lab with, um, it, it's actually a lot of space. I know the people in the lab don't think it's a lot of space, but from an industrial engineering perspective, we think this is a lot of space. The people have to walk a significant distance to move the specimens around, this, and there is uh, uh, some con issues with determining where the specimen should be taken. If they have several workstations that they can take the specimen to, 
How do they decide? How does the individual technician at the time decide which workstation should receive that work? And so they try, it appears, they try to balance the work between the workstations, but there is no methodology behind that. And if we look at two different uh, uh, team members that are doing this task, uh, they'll make the decision differently. And so we wanted to look at how we could uh, determine a, a standard methodology for handling the specimens, moving the specimens from where they come in, through the window or through the tubes. We wanted to reduce the amount of movement, and that's, that's what these lines are representing. This is the, uh, where did my mouse, there it is. Uh, where did, these are the, uh, the movements that the uh, uh, people that are working in the lab, this is how much distance they have to move. And to some extent, the thickness of the line is representative of, of how much uh, uh, movement there is. Um, so we want to reduce the, the movement. We want to have a unidirectional flow of the materials through the lab. And there's, there, there's this whole shuffling of paper, you want to call it. But, I mean, it's this handling, repeated handling of the requisitions, the paper requisitions. And so we wanted to reduce that. So the, we gave the, this is an undergraduate project, and this was done during the spring quarter last year. So they, we gave them some pretty um, tight design constraints. You can't assume that you can move any walls. You can't do any construction or deconstruction. And you can't move the refrigeration units, which would be wonderful if we could uh, change the location of some of the refrigeration units in conjunction with the, the, uh, the paths that people take in the, uh, in the lab. So when we, when we look at the results that the students came up with after doing their analysis, so they collected data, they built these models to look at how much, where the intensity of traffic was, and then they did some brainstorming, they talked to the people that work in the labs, they looked at some other uh, facilities to understand how they work, and so this was their initial uh, change to the design. And so you can see what they've done is they've managed to get rid of the um, flow that was uh, in the upper right-hand corner there that was concerned with that paper shuffling. And the way they got rid of that was to incorporate a high-speed requisition scanner. So the requisitions are processed through the workstation, and they're never touched again. After the workstation, they're scanned, and then they're put in a box to be archived or disposed of. And anyone that needs to query against those requisitions can do it electronically. They're going to be online. And you can do it from wherever you are if you have permission to access that information. The other thing that they did was you can see that they significantly changed the orientation of the workstations. And it's a little bit difficult to see on the slide, but they moved the, um, the workstation where the lead sits which is right here previously, and the lead is actually looking at the backs of each one of the people that they're, they're uh, working with. So they move the lead station so that the lead station is right here, and the individuals in the workstations are facing the lead. So it improves the communications and uh, makes it a more effective work environment. They've also, there's another team that worked on a redesign of the workstations, and we're going to look at that in in conjunction with the uh, human factors issues. Okay. Oh, they also, the, uh, they, uh, besides creating this process for moving the specimens into the workstations, the other alternative that they came up with was instead of this person walking this distance, uh, actually have some mechanical device that would move those specimens to the front of the workstations and the uh, particular team member would move those, remove those from the device and process them. And so instead of having individual queues at each workstation, it's a shared queue, just like you have if you go into the bank, right? Okay, so now the, the next problem was concerned with human factors. And human factors is, is the physical relationship between uh, people and the equipment, the machinery, the devices, in many cases for us, it's the chairs that we're seated on, seated, seated on, 
and the, uh, the uh, computers that we're using, so the keyboards as well as the uh, chairs and the work surfaces. So here's, here's three examples, and if you look at this first example on the left, you'll see that this woman can't really get up to her workstation. She can't get to it, and her work area that she has available to her is really to her left, and so it's impossible for her to get uh, in a comfortable position, it's in, and it's, it's a likely a position where she would uh, create discomfort and potential for uh, injury. In this particular, in the lower left-hand corner, we have uh, uh, someone that's probably six, six foot, six foot one, uh, working in the same workstation where people that are just barely breaking five feet work. And there's just an insufficient range for adjustment of that workstation to accommodate that range of individuals. And then here we have another one of the uh, team members working, uh, and you can see he has un his, his wrists are unsupported, he has zero workspace, and he is moving you know, materials back and forth across this workspace as he's working at this uh, aliquot station. So these were, these were uh, uh, a couple of the areas that we wanted to look at and uh, uh, address the uh, human factors issues. So we wanted to um, improve the workstation interface with the user. So this is the ergonomics aspect of it. We wanted to improve the flow of work through the workstation. So previously we were talking about the flow of work through the labs. Now we're just talking about one particular, you know, in an individual workstation. We want it to flow left to right and not do any of this backflow or right to left, whichever case would be appropriate for the uh, operation. So how can we do that by changing the workstations? How can we get the documents that the people have to manage under control? How do we permit the changing of the workstation configurations? So can we make the workstations smaller? There's quite a bit of real estate used up with the workstations as they're de designed now. And we have a large amount of information, reference information, that the, the employees use or should use that is online and accessible to them. Standard operating procedures, phone numbers, uh, a lot of different documents, and more of them are being added on a daily basis. The difficulty with doing that, though, with accessing that information, is that they have a small screen and that screen has the patient information or it has the document information associated with the specimen that they're processing at the time. So what we want to do is increase the amount of screen space, give them a bigger screen, give them two screens, so that they can have those reference documents that are electronic in electronic format. So they, we know that they have the most recent information instead of a paper copy that they keep at their workstation with them. So the first uh, example of the, you know, when we went through the first iteration, the students came up with, with this shape. And this was based upon, you know, observation in the labs, how the people were working, the problems that they were encountering, and how could they adjust, how could they make a workstation that would uh, uh, be much more friendly and uh, provide a much better interface to the work that the people were trying to accomplish. And then during the, uh, the next quarter, the uh, students that came along after the uh, first group uh, refined the, uh, the, the uh, product. And now we're, you know, we've talked about building these ourselves, but you know, really what this does is this informs us much better about if we go out and purchase commercial equipment, we know what functionality we're looking for. So we've gone through the exercise to determine what functionality we need in this particular environment. Rather than flipping through a catalog beforehand and saying, oh, this looks like this would work better than what we have now. So we've gone through the process of really identifying what our needs are. OK, so now, now I'm going I'm to take you back to when was algebra, eighth grade? Not anymore? Okay, so we'll go back to fifth grade algebra. <clears throat> and what we want to do is we want to, I want you to understand a little bit about, uh, about optimization because industrial engineers use optimization a lot. We, we throw the, well, we don't throw the term around, but uh, 
people that don't understand what we mean by optimization throw the term optimization around. And it has a very specific meaning. So these, these methodologies, and you, you've probably heard of them as, as linear programming or uh, integer programming, um, these, these methodologies are, are significant contributors to the uh, competitiveness of a lot of organizations and in particular the airline industry. The airline industry could not exist as it does today without these methodologies. They use them for scheduling. If you think about the challenges that airline industries have of making sure that the right planes, the crews, and the passengers are in the right places when they should be, that the maintenance is performed on aircraft when it should be, and yield management, which is what we all fight when we go in and look for, you know, what's the cost of the airline ticket today? We're fighting yield management uh, with the airlines because what they're doing is they're keeping that price as high as uh, possible, as long as possible. And because they don't want the plane to fly with empty seats, that's lost revenue. But they also don't want to sell those seats too soon. So they've got mathematical models using optimization methodologies to help them determine when to bring the prices down, when to increase the prices. It's heavily dependent upon computing resources, very much so. And in fact, some of the problems that we're, in, we're still investigating, you know, if you calculate how long it would take to look at all the combinations using these algorithms, some of them would take literally centuries on the fastest machines we have. So obviously there's research opportunities there to determine what are some heuristics that we can use or methodologies that we can use to maybe not get the optimum, but to get something that's good. So the, uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, a problem. And uh, this is a toy problem, obviously. It's going to be two-dimensional so that we can get our head around it. But he here's what the problem is. We have um, a situation where for every 50 gallons of some raw material. So let's just say uh, crude oil, all right? So for every 50 gallons of crude oil, we can make uh, a number of products. And two of those products that we want to pay attention to are premium and regular. And if we trade off between how much of each of those we make, it can influence the total return on that 50 gallons of raw material, all right? And it can pay off in terms of this equation z equals 8x premium plus 2x regular. So let's just say the 8 represents $8 and the 2 represents $2. So for every unit of premium product that we make, we can get $8. For every unit of regular product that we make, we get $2. So now if this is all I told you, what would you make? Yeah, you'd just make premium. Well, the world's not that simple. All right? So we've got lots of constraints. All right? We've got lots of constraints. There's a cost, loss, waste constraint. So depending upon the mixture of the two products, the uh, loss of uh, uh, materials uh, can increase or decrease, right? So it's, and it's a linear. So we're talking about linear programming. So it's a linear constraint. All of these will be linear constraints. We, we decided that we want no more than 65% of the raw material used for these two products. Because remember I said we're going to make a whole collection of products, but we're only going to look at two of them because we're limited in our display technology, all right? So we're going to limit it to 65%. So if you look at the red line, any two numbers that fall, any two uh, uh, intersections of the axes on that red line will represent 65%. We have a con cost constraint, so depending upon how you measure, how you allocate um, the two products that you're making, uh, you have a particular cost constraint that, that uh, 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 limits your decisions. Uh, we have decided that we want to make more regular than premium. I'm not sure why we would decide that. Maybe it was marketing driven, but it's another constraint that we have to take into account. So we're getting further and further away from that, you know, just making all premium, right? We also want to make at least 5% premium.
premium. So at least two and a half gallons are going to be used to make premium, and we're going to say the same thing for regular. So we've kind of boxed in a, a, a domain, haven't we? We've boxed in an area. Now, any data point within that area will satisfy our constraints. Where is the optimum? Where will we get the maximum? Right? Where will we get the maximum? So that's what, op what, that's what the optimization linear uh, programming uh, methodology will tell you. It will help you determine where the optimal point is. Now, can somebody guess where the optimal point is on there? Where would you put it? Would you put it down here? Further up here? It's actually going to be right there. Okay. So the optimal mix will be to use 12.5% of the raw material to make premium, 43.75% to make uh, regular. And when we put those two together, you know, eight times the premium plus two times the regular, we'll get 176. And you can, you know, this is what the students always do this. They always say, oh, no, it looks like there's a better point right back here, right? It looks, it's higher back there. It seems like that would be a better point. Well, in fact, that point is 175. Well, there's not a lot of difference between 175 and 176, but it is not the optimal, right? The maximum, and that's what we said we were looking for. And that's why I said we have a particular meaning when we say uh, optimization. Okay, so, so this, is the, this is the methodology we want to use for the next two, two problems that we're going to look at, the next two uh, projects. And so this is staff scheduling. And we've got two where areas that we want to use, two ways we want to use staff scheduling. We want to use it for operations. So on a daily basis, we want to use it for scheduling. We also want to use it for, for uh, strategic purposes, to understand uh, for planning, long-term planning. So if we look at this, we're, we want to create the tools and techniques to support standard methods for scheduling staff. That's the objective of this project. Not this, this is not the objective of this mathematical function. This is the objective of the project. We want to put in place tools that everyone, because this is, this is a shared uh, task uh, the, among the supervisors within the department. And we need a standard, but we need a standard that will give us all good answers. So we're going to use optimization. And you can see the variance looking at those charts at the bottom. You can see the variance that people are having to deal with the demand. And so if you look at the, the parameters, constraints, and objectives for the, uh, what we're going to have to incorporate in our model, they've got uh, 21 shifts, two different locations. So we've got Harbor View as well as the uh, UW Medical Center. There has to be a minimum number of staff on site. So you have to have a certain amount of capability there, irrespective of the demand. Uh, there's certain credential constraints that so people have to be, you know, you might be someone that's new, just come on, but you don't have enough time, you don't have the training, whatever the case may be. You have preferences that the staff want. So we're drawing all of those lines around this problem, right? We're creating that solution space. Now, our solution space is in multiple dimensions, so we really couldn't draw it, but you get the idea of what we're doing, right? So we, we've got this solution space, and they can be, you know, you can imagine the, the shapes that they could be. Um, and so when we include all of these, we want to determine what would be the best. Now, the best is not necessarily what we're going to use, because we can't put all of the information that we have about the situation into our model. We don't want to do that because it makes the model run longer. So we know that a couple of people don't like to work together or don't work together, play together well, right? So, you know, that's not something we would want to put in the model. But it's something that's going to color our decision when we look at the results that come from the model and the model says, this is the optimum then it would give us some guidance, but if it has some uh, situations there that we don't want to uh, encounter, then we'll make some adjustments to it. So the model is really guiding us, but it's guiding us in a standard way. So if I parameterize the model the same way you parameterize the model, the same values, we will get the exact same number. That's what's critical. 
So it might not be a number that we use, but we will, use, we will get the same number. So we're, we're using the same methodology, which is important. So for strategic planning, and this is going to be in both of these modeling cases, what we're looking at is um, what happens if the demand for our services uh, increases? How much does it have to increase before it will have an impact on our scheduling? What if we reduce the number of uh, staff that we have? How will that impact the, the level of service that we provide? OK, so now the other one that we're going to look at, um, by the way, both of these two problems we're looking at are being um, uh, the responsibility of a couple of PhD students, one that's just about ready to, uh, Shabnam is going to get her, or she's going to defend her thesis uh, in two weeks, and uh, Lynn Ben on the other uh, problem is uh, just starting as a PhD student. But th these, these are the projects that they're working on. Um, in this particular instance, the lab has couriers that go out and bring specimens back to the facility. They also uh, do inter-lab transfers. So what we want to know is how can we optimally configure the routes for these couriers within the constraints that we have. So we have a large geographic region to cover. They have a lot of traffic issues that they have to respond to. They have these constraints by the individual clients. I want you here before 5 o'clock, but I don't want you here before 4.45. So here's the window. I'm going to lock up at 5 o'clock, so you need to be in the building. But I don't want you here before 4.45 unless you want to sit in the lobby because I might still be drawing some more specimens that I want to send with you. So we have these constraints by individual clients that we have to meet. And we have to minimize the total travel time, and we're always trying to manage costs. Right? So this is, this is an, another uh, optimization problem that we're going to use that we're going to build those constraints and we're going to use the simplex method or some other method to solve those and help us determine what the optimal is. And really, we don't necessarily want to use that optimal. What we really want to do is understand that solution space. And we want to understand where the sensitivities are. So does it really help to add more couriers? Does it really help to add more routes? Does it help? to increase the number of, uh, of uh, visits that we make per day to our, to our clients. So that's from a strategic standpoint, that's what we, we, the way we want to use this model as well. Now we've got all of these things going on. What we need is we need some way to put all of this together. We want to look at the overall system. So we're making all these different changes. Fundamentally, what we're doing is local optimization. Right? So we're talking about the system, but really we're locally optimizing each one of these subsystems. So what we're going to do is we're going to use simulation. This is the most effective way to, to put together all of these subsystems or these, these complex systems and understand how they work together. So in this case, we've got the courier operations that ben, Lynn Ben's working on, the staff schedules that Shabnam is working on. Operations, Dr. Uh, Grimm has been working with us on improving operations in the lab. And then uh, uh, Dr. Strathman has been developing a uh, tracking system to maintain, ch uh, maintain chain of custody and provide early visibility on the specimens. Because in some cases, we don't know what's coming into the labs until the courier brings it in and sits it down on the workstation. Right? So it would be nice to know that those specimens, maybe it would be nice to know. I mean, we think it would be nice to know. We love technology, so we think it would be a great thing to have RFID and real-time GPS and all this traffic information, and we would know what was coming into us. So we want to build a simulation model and really explore, would there be any value from that? So before we go build some of this system, before we invest time and energy in doing this, we can actually build the model in the computer and explore these questions and determine, does it make sense for us to 
uh, build a system that will provide this information. We're going to have much more complex models. We're going to have uh, a need for additional uh, computing resources and so forth. So that's sort of pulling it all together. Right? Now, when we close the loop, and I'm going to do this very quickly, um, when we started out, we talked about the fundamentals. We talked about how uh, Frederick Taylor was a developer of the fundamentals, Lillian and uh, Frank Gilbreth extended those fundamentals, but they were really uh, very empirically based. Uh, but it was looking at the actual operations and it was looking at the environment that people worked in. And, and we kind of forgot about that. And when I say we, I really mean North America. We, we kind of forgot about that. Europe as well. We, we, we forgot about those fundamentals that we learned. Quality went downhill. We, we increased enormously the volume of product that we were producing, but the uh, customers were not very satisfied with it. And the Japanese kind of hit us upside the head um, in the late 80s and the 90s. And there was a book that was published in 1990 called The Machine That Changed the World. And it really pointed out by looking at all of the manufacturing, uh, excuse me, my, looking at the automotive assembly plants all over the world and comparing them, what made the Toyota plants so much better. And the fundamental conclusion was uh, this, this collection of lean processes. And the lean processes that we're talking about, the lean methodologies, three components, flow, pull, and improve. Flow means the work, so this could be a patient, this could be a specimen, but whatever the work is or in the manufacturing environment, it's the, the vehicle that you're assembling or the component that you're manufacturing, moves through the system without resting. It doesn't sit. So when I come in to have my blood drawn for a test, I shouldn't be there very long at all. I should, the ideal would be for me to walk up to the desk, check in, and immediately be taken back and have the blood drawn, right? So that's what we mean by flow. Pull, act, pull means that we tie activities that we perform to demand from the customer. And this is basically the way that uh, lab medicine works, uh, clinical uh, labs work. Uh, we don't really do tests that, customer, uh, that patients don't ask us to do. Uh, we don't do those until they're asked for. However, if we look at the blood draw, the AM, PM blood draws that we do, these are scheduled, and these are sort of a, a batch push situation instead of a pull. And so this is, uh, you know, right now we're looking at in implementing the uh, uh, blood draw on demand. So that's much more the, uh, in the spirit of uh, lean production systems. But fundamental, and this is what changes the culture of the organization, is this whole idea of improvements should be the responsibility of everyone in the organization. It's not just the responsibility of the supervisors. It's not just the responsibility of the managers. It's not just the responsibility of the lab directors of the vice president of operations. It's everyone's responsibility. It's the responsibility of the people that are doing the work that are touching the specimens. And it's, it's quite different, and, it, and it, uh, it, it's a, a major cultural change for people to be asked to be involved and to think about how to improve the operations that they're performing, the tasks that they, they are responsible for. So we're running a little bit late, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip here to the end. And, um, when we think about uh, these fundamentals of industrial engineering, we've now captured them in this whole concept of, of lean Toyota production system methodology. So the fundamentals, this, this doesn't necessarily have, say anything about the uh, mathematical methods that we've been talking about using, but it's just the fundamentals of improving the system. And it's, you know, it's based upon these concepts of elimination of waste, um, 5S means a place for everything, everything in its place, so you don't spend time and energy looking for things that you need to do to accomplish your work. Uh, and visual management uh, is uh, assuring that the environment is organized and you can uh, locate uh, materials, tools, um, or uh, people that you need uh, to provide help to you very easily. 
Uh, but the, the objective is to uh, accomplish uh, quality, safety, cost, and performance. And that's built upon these three pillars of flow, JIT, and pull that we talked about. Developing the team members and data-driven root cause analysis and VSM is value stream mapping. It's really looking at not only how you would how the uh, value adding portions of the system operate, but where actually documenting where you're wasting, whether it's motion, energy, time, whatever the case may be, and then using that as a basis for making changes. So if you think about this, it's very similar. It's different colors, it's different words, but it is fundamentally what we were talking about 100 years ago. What are, the what are the component tasks that we perform? How can we improve those? Documenting what they are and involving the worker in improving the system and understanding the system. So, so, uh, so I asked my daughter after I went through this version, right? with the dogs and the cats and the airplanes and the trains. I said, um, so Emily, d does that help you understand a little bit better what, in what industrial engineers do? And here's what she said. So dad, you don't make stuff, right? <laughs> Go to sleep, Emily. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions you might have. I have a question um, about the Toyota system. I guess it, to, to make the question as blunt as possible is why didn't the Toyota system prevent Toyota from screwing up so badly with their most recent recalls of all, and all their quality problems, which seems that you know, a robust production system that looked for quality and all that should have caught all that stuff and not let them send out all those brake pedals that didn't work, et cetera. Right. So the question was how come you know, we, in the last, um, I guess, the last eight or ten months, uh, Toyota had all these problems uh, that were in the press about uh, with, with the vehicles, various uh, issues. I mean, they fundamentally didn't follow the, um, uh, the tenants that they had proposed uh, were what, what, what they followed. They, they didn't do it. They just didn't. And, and, and should there have been uh, meta structures in there to prevent that? I think that's what the, um, uh, the senior... Uh, uh, leadership in the organization really is, right? That's what the senior leadership should have done. And in fact, the senior leadership fell down on that and didn't assure that Toyota stayed with those uh, tenants that they had been so successful with for uh, 50 or 60 years, actually. So, you know, it was interesting. We were doing uh, lean training. We were doing orientation into the Toyota production system um, in the labs when all of this was going on and I can't tell you how many times I had people say that to me and say well we should ignore it look it didn't work for Toyota you know if, if you don't do it you're right it, it won't work. Just to, to follow up on that it's a very nice talk and it, it, it's clearly very helpful for our department and our operations to do this but you know sometimes it's worth looking at, at the the failures of the method as well as the successes of the method. So can you, can you think of some examples of where an industrial engineering approach sort of crashed and burned and, and what was sort of learned, learned from that that uh, would be helpful? Because I mean, sometimes there's sort of these meta issues, if sure. you will, that, that, that can make it fail. And, uh, so you want me to, he's asked me to talk about failures of industrial engineers. <laughs> Did I summarize that well? But, you, you know, I, I, we love technology, right? We just love technology. And that's why I said it's important for us to look at these potential bunny trails that we are thinking about going down, that we, we use our tools to look at those and to evaluate or to get some sense of is there anything out there in that solution space that looks like a winner for us if we went down that direction, all right? So I think, the, the, uh, uh, I think that's one of the problems that you have. So the, the failures that I see, I, I can talk on two sides. I can talk on the technology side when people uh, 
uh, use a, take a, uh, adopt a solution that is way too complex. Number one, they haven't done root cause analysis. They haven't really understood what their problem is. We do this in this or we, we do that in this organization with purchasing. And I'm sure I'll have a price on my head now. But you know, we all squirrel away extra materials because it is such a pain to get purchasing to do anything on a timely basis. Now I, you know, I, I know that's that's harsh, but I've, I've, I, we see it too many times. And so we're not doing root cause analysis. So, so number one, we don't use, do root cause analysis as engineers, as industrial engineers, and we look at here's a technology that will fix this, but we're fixing the wrong problem. Now, on the side of um, uh, the Toyota production methodology, to the Toyota production system, lean, there is a progression in applying these methodologies. And many times we just look at the whole collection of tools that are out there and we say, this one really looks like a good one. I want to use this one. But you're not ready to use this tool if you haven't learned to do this, to do this, to do this, and to do this. You won't be successful. It won't stick. So this is the issue that we continually wrestle with, it's called 5S. And I told you that 5S fundamentally means clean up the place, right? So get rid of stuff you don't need. Have a place for everything. Make sure it's there. Label it. And that's a discipline that you have to learn before you start talking about doing value stream mapping, Kaizen events, and all these other things.